The Russian Newspaper Monitor is a Newsbud production made possible by you, our supporters. Visit our Kickstarter campaign and pledge your support for independent media. Hello, friends. I'm Professor Filip Kovacevic, and this is the fourth edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. Today, I begin as I typically do, with the Rasiskaya Gazeta, the Russian government-owned newspaper. I do this to find out the direction of the political currents in the Kremlin, and also to see what has been on Vladimir Putin's mind lately. So let's look at the edition for October 23rd, 2016. There is an article that concerns the United States in the middle of the front page. The title is Not on the Right Target, with the subtitle explaining that Americans in Iraq bomb civilians more and more frequently. The article is continued on page 7, accompanied by a photograph of a bomb exploding near what seems to be ordinary-looking houses somewhere in Iraq. The article begins by mentioning the statement of the Russian Ministry of Defense spokesman, General Igor Konashenko, who is already familiar to you since I quoted him a couple weeks ago when I discussed the article of the Russian missile system Iskander M. Konashenko said that the ministry has been following closely not only the situation in Syria, but also the unfolding events in Iraq. According to his data, since October 17, the Iraqi forces, assisted by the international coalition led by the United States, have been conducting a military operation, the goal of which is to block the forces of the Islamic State in Mosul. Just in the last 24 hours, the Russian Ministry of Defense noted that the international coalition, which is essentially the U.S. military planes, flew 22 sorties and attacked 19 targets in Iraq. However, according to Konashenko, some of these bombs did more harm than good because they did not hit any ISIS terrorists, but instead killed innocent Iraqi civilians. He gave the specific example of the bombing which took place on October 21st in Dakuk, 30 miles south of the Iraqi city of Kirkuk. There, the bombs hit the funeral procession, and according to witness reports, dozens of Iraqis were wounded and killed, including women and children. Konashenkov emphasized that such attacks on civilians, which according to him have the character of war crimes, have become the routine mode of operation for the U.S. military in Iraq. In addition, Konashenkov mentioned the October 18th attack by two Belgian military F-16s, which are the part of the U.S.-led international coalition on the Kurdish village Hazajek in Syria where six people lost their lives and four were wounded. This attack was denied by the Belgian Ministry of Defense, and the evidence for it, presented by its Russian counterparts, was described as incorrect. However, the article gives a very detailed itinerary of these two planes from their takeoff in Jordan until they returned to the base several hours later. It even includes the fact that the planes were twice refueled in mid-air by the U.S. military aerial refueling aircraft KC-135. The knowledge of this itinerary is obviously the result of the very attentive Russian surveillance over the Syrian and Iraqi skies. In fact, in my opinion, one of the purposes of this article was precisely to let the Russian audience and the world at large know about the extensive surveillance capacities of the Russian military. The other purpose was to signal 
to the United States and its allies in Syria that Russia would not accept to be blamed for the bombing of the civilians and the alleged war crimes without retaliating in kind and chronicling the similar alleged atrocities by the other side. Right below this article on page seven is a very revealing commentary by the well-known Russian journalist, Maxim Makarichev, in which he hatingly attacks the conduct of the US foreign policy. The title is American Cynicism, and the subtitle specifies that the United States raised the double standard into the main postulate of its foreign policy. Makarichev begins by quoting the official spokeswoman of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Maria Zaharova, who called on all countries which have influence on the opposition forces in Syria to do all they can to restrain the rebel fighters. However, Zaharova also added that the West is not only not doing anything to restrain the rebels, but is actually giving them a free hand to continue their violent activities, including the attacks on civilians. And this is especially the case with the Jebhat Al-Nusra group. At the same time, the Western representatives in the UN Security Council are blaming Russia for the humanitarian catastrophe in Aleppo. This, according to Zaharova, is both cynical and perfidious because Russia is doing all it can to actually send the humanitarian aid into Aleppo, where it is faced with the increased attacks of those supported by Washington, including the so-called moderate opposition. Makarichev continues this same line of argument by pointing out that at the same time that the United States is strongly critical of the Syrian government military offensive assisted by the Russians against the militants in Syria, it is organizing what he calls the incongruous mix of forces, the Iraqi government, the Kurds, the Turks, the Sunni, the Shia, the Christians, to attack the very same militants in Mosul, Iraq. Makarichio calls this the prime example of the hypocritical double standards in action. He claims that this is the key element of the United States foreign policy which could be clearly perceived since the early 1990s and the Clinton administration's interventions in the Balkans, when the official narrative painted the false picture of bad Serbs and good Bosnian Muslims. The same cynical policy was later applied to other US military interventions in Iraq, in Libya, and in Syria, which turned these once wealthy and stable countries into the chaotic places of destruction and death and the sources of millions of refugees. Makarichev states that over the years, the lying and deception of the official Washington only got worse and that right now its only guiding principle seems to be whoever is the enemy of Russia is our friend. Nothing else matters not even the criminal nature of the actions of these friends on the grounds in Syria and Iraq. Makarichio claims that the United States mass media obediently transmits the propaganda of the US military authorities by minimizing the number of the civilian casualties in the current operation against the ISIS fighters in Mosul. At the same time, the same media the same media companies constantly blame Russia for the civilian casualties in Aleppo, calling their suffering a war crime against humanity and not caring to do any independent investigations of their own, which would reveal that most of the reports supposedly coming out of Aleppo are fake. Another example of the double standard discussed by Maka Richard is the report that some U.S. states may criminally prosecute the Russian diplomats if they decide to visit polling stations during the U.S. presidential elections. At the same time, he points out that 
if some other country banned the United States diplomats in the same way, this would be presented as the attack on democracy and universal human rights by the U.S. political and media establishment. Makarichov dwells on the tremendous suffering of civilians going on in Mosul at this time brought about by the hastily put together U.S.-led military operation. He claims that the only reason this operation was started right now is to enable the departing president, Barack Obama, to accomplish something in Iraq before he leaves office. This is all done to brush up the tarnished Obama legacy, according to Makarichev. He also finds that there are many problems in this Iraqi operation that the United States did not care to address in order, in order to have a quick victory. These problems include another flood of millions of refugees likely to leave Iraq, as well as the thousands of the escaping militants who will go into Syria, complicating the war there, or to Europe to organize even more terrorist attacks. Makarichev concludes his article by saying that considering the two-faced and cynical policies implemented by the United States in the Middle East, the Russian government officials and diplomats should be very careful in dealing with their United States colleagues. The U.S. diplomats are not to be trusted to fulfill any obligations they take upon themselves. In my opinion, this article is one of the harshest attacks on the U.S. foreign policy establishment I have seen so far in the Rasiskaya Gazeta. And take into, into consideration that the newspaper is 100% owned by the Russian government. This tells me that the relations between Russia and the United States have just hit, if not the rock bottom, then a dangerously low point. Now let's move to a different newspaper. Let's go to Nezavisimaya Gazeta, which is the middle of the road newspaper. And let's look at the edition for October 26, 2016. In the middle of the front page, there is an article entitled, Washington and Moscow are getting ready for the battle for the Arctic, accompanied by the photo of a group of Russian soldiers with weapons in a new generation snowmobile. The caption below the photo says, the special forces are successfully taking fighting positions in the Arctic. The subtitle of the article specifies that Pentagon has landed US special forces in Norway, while Russia is building new military bases in its Northern territories, where it has also moved its rocket systems. The article begins by stating that for the first time since the end of the World War II, Norway will base a battalion of the U.S. Marines on its territory. A battalion means from 800 to 2,000 soldiers. These Marines will be specially trained for the sabotage activities in the rear of the enemy. And that, according to the article, is obviously Russia. The Norwegian Minister of Defense, Ine Eriksen Sereide, said that the military base in Vernes, which is in central Norway, was chosen as the site for the location of the U.S. officers and soldiers. In addition, she said that they will get a chance to run military exercises throughout the country, including in the areas very close to the border with Russia and the naval bases of the Russian Northern Fleet, which, let me remind you, includes nuclear missiles carrying submarines. The article reminds its readers that the United States also recently signed a military agreement with Iceland, which allows the United States to base its military forces in the Icelandic base called Keblodik. The article interprets this move as yet another example of the U.S. rapidly seeking to encircle Russia militarily. 
It was the statement by the U.S. Colonel William Bentley, who said in an interview with CNN in February 2016 that the U.S. already transferred significant number of tanks and heavy artillery to central Norway, where they are guarded by, guarded by about 100 Norwegian and U.S. soldiers. He also stated that the caves in the region could take in up to 15,000 individuals. According to Bentley, basing troops here allows the United States to intervene quickly if there is ever a crisis. One wonders what kind of crisis Bentley had in mind. The article also notes that the concrete steps to increase the U.S. military presence in the Arctic took place much before the violent political crisis in Ukraine and the Russian takeover of Crimea, which means that this was an element in the long-term plan against Russia, which involved military advancements on many different fronts at the same time. While at this time, the U.S.-NATO advancement in the South has been successfully stalled by Russia, the advancement in the North appears to be gathering up force, and it may only be a question of time until there is a serious military confrontation. The article quotes the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, as saying that the Arctic plays an important part in the Russian national defense, and that Russia plans to increase heavily its military presence there. Along the same lines, the Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, recently stated that Russia has moved its S-300 rocket systems to new locations on several archipelagos in the Arctic, including the land of Franz Joseph, New Land, Wrangel, and Kotelny. Shoigu also noted that more Russian troops have been sent to the region. Moreover, some Russian military experts claim that by the end of the year, Russia will install the missile complex Baal someplace in the Arctic and place it under the control of its northern fleet. What these rapid U.S. and Russian military maneuvers in the Arctic tell me is that those cold seas can at any moment turn very hot and perhaps even go nuclear. This is why the Arctic is an important piece in the dangerous geopolitical chess game going on between the United States and Russia. I think we should always keep an eye on the Arctic, no matter how explosive the situation in Syria and the Middle East gets to be in the coming weeks and months. Now, let's go to Commerçant, a liberal pro-business newspaper, the edition for October 26, 2016. In this edition, there is a front page article with the enigmatic title, The Advancement in the Server's Direction. But the subtitle clarifies the issue, Roscomnadzor might block LinkedIn. The Roskomnadzor stands for the Russian Federal Agency for the Supervision in the Sphere of Information Technologies and Mass Communications. The article begins by explaining that, that LinkedIn might become the first victim of the new Russian law on personal data. This law requires that all social media companies collecting personal data of the Russian citizens move their servers into Russia. LinkedIn has not complied so far. And in addition, in addition to that, according to the Russian prosecutors, it continues to collect personal information from Russian citizens who are not LinkedIn subscribers without their authorization. One court in Moscow has already made the decision in favor of the prosecution. And if another high-level court concurs with the decision, LinkedIn will have to leave Russia. According to the prosecution, LinkedIn violated the Russian law on personal data, which states that every citizen 
has the right to privacy in his or her personal life, including keeping personal and family secrets. The court agreed that the company violated the law in two respects. First, it does not keep the personal data of Russian citizens on the territory of Russia, as it was required to do since September 2015. And secondly, it also collects the personal information of the third parties who visit and surf the site without asking them for authorization. Essentially, the Russian prosecutors accused LinkedIn of spying on us unsuspecting Russians, and this is why they asked the court to block the company. LinkedIn appealed the district court decision, and the hearing at the Moscow Court of Appeals will take place on November 10, 2016. According to the article, the Russian prosecutors are concerned that the personal information of the Russian citizens could easily be hacked, as it already happened in the past. For instance, in May of this year, the underground internet platform The Real Deal published information that unknown hackers offered to sell more than 100 million passwords for LinkedIn accounts worldwide. However, in my opinion, the real takeaway from this story is the fact that the new Cold War between the United States and Russia is raging not only in various geographical regions, such as the Middle East or the Arctic, but also in cyberspace. Obviously, the Russians are aware of the secret links between various social media companies and the U.S. intelligence agencies and have decided to pull the plug on their proxy spying technologies. LinkedIn is likely to be only the first one in the long line of those to be kicked out and replaced by the Russian or even Chinese equivalents. And the last article for today comes from Pravda, the newspaper of the opposition Communist Party of Russia, and the edition for October 25th, 2016. There is a very interesting article on page four about what this article calls the mass repressions in Lithuania against civil society activists who have organized protests against the foreign policies of the current government and especially against the increased militarization of the country. Let me remind you that more and more soldiers from various NATO nations, including the United States and Canada, are present in Lithuania supposedly to defend the small Baltic state against the Russian attack. Lithuania is a former republic of the Soviet Union, which declared independence in 1991 and is now a member of both NATO and the European Union. But as can be seen from this article, the Lithuanian government engages in non-democratic practices against those who do not share its aggressively anti-Russian political positions. The government does not respect basic human rights of its citizens, and yet it calls on other countries, especially Russia, to follow democratic procedures and respect the rule of law. This is hypocrisy, pure and simple, the cynical application of the double standard I mentioned earlier. The article chronicles the cases of three Lithuanian citizens, well-known civil society activists who are now under arrest without any genuine proof that they have taken part in the anti-constitutional activities. One of them is Gilvinas Razminas, who is a member of the Socialist National Front and the political party called the Fighters for Lithuania. He is known for organizing several anti-NATO and anti-EU public protests, and this is likely to be the real reason for his arrest. The newspaper Pravda also has a section in which 
which it calls the pulse of the planet, in which it briefly summarizes the current actions of anti-government protests in the world. In the edition for October 25th, for instance, three such protests were mentioned. First, the protests in Rome against the government of Mario Renzi. Secondly, the protest of the police officers in many cities in France demanding higher wages and better job protection. And lastly, the protest in Warsaw against the state ban on abortion. As can be seen, one of the main orientations of Pravda's editorial policy is to connect the struggles of the Russian workers and peasants, as represented by the Communist Party, to the wider international anti-globalist front and the struggle against the global oligarchy. Dear friends, that's all for this week. Thank you for your time. Be cool and stay cool until the next edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. This has been a NewsBud production made possible by you. Please visit our Kickstarter campaign and pledge your support for independent media.